Hello and welcome to thehawkeye.org. My name is Nick Fiorillo. I'm editor-in-chief of The Hawkeye. We're joined today by State Senator Rosemary McAuliffe. Uh, Senator McAuliffe, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate it. I'm delighted to join you. Very Great. exciting. We're here today to talk about education, mostly as you are the ranking member on the Senate Early Learning and K-12 Education uh, Committee. And you're also a member of the Higher Education Committee. So we've got a couple issues we want to talk to you today about um, our, our education system in Washington. The first, of course, is the McCleary decision. Um, I'm sure you're spending a lot of time on it. it it's occupying a lot of your, your time. But um, just a little background for our viewers. In 2012, it was upheld by the Supreme Court that the legislature was not fully funding um, education under Article 9, Section 1 of the state constitution, the um, paramount duty, right? Um, and recently, the, the court um, decided to hold the legislature in contempt because they were not moving quickly enough on, on fully funding education. So we're wondering what's your response to that ruling and, and the contempt uh, holding. Excellent. Well, Nick, let me just give you a little bit of background. Mm -hmm. In 2009, the legislature passed House Bill 22, 2776. And in that bill, it um, laid out what fully funding basic education would look like. Mm -hmm. And so it outlined it. And pretty much the court followed that and said, you have defined basic education, and now you must uh, fu fund it. But you have until the year 2018, which is what the bill said mm -hmm. itself. So now we're at 2015 legislative session, and we do a biennium, biennium so it's 2015, 16, 17. Mm -hmm. So 2018 is approaching. Mm -hmm. And how much have we invested less than... Um, one billion dollars in order to fully fund basic ed as defined it would cost us between five and six billion okay so um i think what's important to realize here is that it's n our children can't wait our students in your schools can't wait mm -hmm. we need to be sure that they have um, adequate class size that they have all of the things that they need to fulfill their basic education and unless we fully fund this we, our children, are, are, are the ones that will be harmed. Mm -hmm. Now, when the court ruled that we were in contempt, I was very excited and very pleased because now it will force the legislator's hand. I've been around for 20 years, and I've seen the promise to fully fund basic education for 20 years, and it has not happened. Mm -hmm. So now we have reached an end game, and I'm very excited about that. The court has given us some time now mm -hmm. to to finish this legislative session and to come up with the plan to fund. And if they do this, um, if we don't do this, I should say, then they can mean that our budget is obsolete. They can tell us we can't give any tax preferences until we fully fund. You know, they have some choices and uh, we need to be held accountable. Okay. My next question is, you know, why did it have to come to this, right? Why is that court order necessary for, for legislation? Why? Why in the first place wasn't the legislation or the legislature, you know, taking public education as a top priority? Why? What, what's the cause of this problem, do you think? Mm, it's pretty extensive when you look at the downturn in the economy, mm -hmm. which happened around 2008, 9, and 10, slow recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a matter of really having the tax dollars that we have to have in order to fully fund basic education. Actually, you have to recognize as well that when we do pass a tax, so a bottle tax, a Coke tax, pop tax, um, the people have rejected it. Mm -hmm. And so we have not even be, been able to raise a tax that could, do, could provide the funding we need. I see. So the other thing you have a choice of is to um, el eliminate some of the tax breaks that we give out to businesses. Mm -hmm. But you have to be careful because it's an economic value to have our businesses like Boeing stay in our state. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's very difficult to find the revenue. Mm -hmm. Very difficult. Okay. What are then the goals for this, this next session? What's, what are the problems that you're facing? Where is do you differ with your opposition? What are, what's the kind of conflict right now between the I think solution? The conflict is the fact that um, I'd say, I guess the uh, majority party, who is now the Republicans mm -hmm. um, and, um, and two Democrats, the problem with that, uh, their thinking is that they want to have more policies if we're going to give more funding. So mm -hmm. they want to say, you have to pass these policies and be accountable. You know what? I've been around since um, 
1993. We've passed bills all through these 20 years making our schools more accountable. We have tests now and assessments mm -hmm. for students. We have evaluation systems for teachers. We have really come a long way. So we need to fund what we have promised mm -hmm. <laughs> and not continually do new things without the basic funding for what we know we need. Okay. Are you worried at all about um, sort of a, a bad precedent for governing for when the the um, so the court has to order the legislature to cer sort of pass certain legislation. Is that a, a potential concern for a separation of powers issue? Is that do you see that as ever being an issue? I think for some people it is, but for me, um, I feel the court has to hold us accountable. It is our paramount duty. It's in the Constitution mm -hmm. for the state of Washington. Um, I'm not concerned about separation of powers. I'm concerned that they um, they hold us accountable. Okay. Okay. My next topic I want to talk about is uh, this new initiative that's going to be on the ballot, mm -hmm. Initiative 1351, mm -hmm. um, which would lower class sizes and um, you know put more teachers in the building. Mm -hmm. um, and I know, are you in support of 1351? I'm definitely in support. Okay. What what would Mount Terrace High School look like in other schools? Um, in say the the initiative's passed, it's fully implemented. What changes would we see here at a school level? Um, in Malik Terrace, let me ask you this question. Mm -hmm. How many students do you have in your uh, biology class or your science class? Uh, there's uh, there's quite a bit. Um, you know, <laughs> Is there enough labs for these students? Uh, I know it's pretty tight in, in a lot of our classes. Right. So what we really care about is looking at class size so that every child has an opportunity for individual attention. Okay. So you're talking about, in the lower grades, you're talking about um, 17 to 20 students. Mm -hmm. In your upper grades, you're thinking of more like 25, 22, 25 in that category. In your science classrooms where there's a lab, mm -hmm. you need to have every child have a station. Okay. It's not okay in some school districts they're standing right. around the room until it's time for them to switch over and get a chance at the lab. So schools need to have teachers, counselors, nurses, and people who support students and student learning. It isn't all about that child in that classroom and that chair. Mm -hmm. It's about their whole life and what their needs are. And so we need to actually do that. Today we don't have even a nurse for maybe every 12 schools. Maybe not even that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And counselors in a high school? How many counselors do you have? I think about, about four to five. Uh -huh. And how many students? <laughs> about 1,300 or yeah. so. So yeah. see, you, they each have about 400 students, okay. 300, 400. That's not okay. A counselor can't really give you the guidance you need on to, for college. Mm -hmm. and, all, and then if you do have other needs, you know, family issues, things like that, they can't really help 400 kids. Right. It's hard. So okay. it's important. Sure. You know, the the main criticism of this initiative has been the price tag. I mean, mm -hmm. the Office of Financial Management estimated that it would cost uh, $3.7 billion for the every two-year session once it's implemented. Um, and many are saying, you know, in wake of the McCleary decision and everything, there's just not, we don't have the funding for it. Um, other critics say it, it could be a repeat of Initiative 728, which was passed in 2000, a similar bill that was, you know, they, they passed it, there was no way of funding it, eventually it kept being suspended and then was repealed. Do you find, are you concerned about the, the lack of funding or about the potential funding issues with this initiative? So what I think this initiative will do is send a message to the legislature. Okay. It will strongly say that the, our public, our people, our families believe in small class size for our children and our students. That's important. It's an important message. Um, if the people believe and mm -hmm. support small class size, then maybe if the legislature says, if we take this le uh, stream of taxes and put it toward funding this initiative, mm -hmm. will you support us? The public has to support us. If they don't, we can say, we're going to take this stream of revenue and we're going to put it toward the small class size and they can repeal it. Sure. Okay. Do you think um, this is sort of indicative of a, of, a, of a funding problem in our state or with our tax code? Do you think that our tax code is, is flawed a little bit in the way that you know we can't even fund our public schools? Yes, it is flawed, and I've had a bill for quite a few years, Nick, where um, we lower the sales tax and lower the B&O, and then you have for the high-end earner, you mm -hmm. have a high-end income tax, mm -hmm. and that makes the tax system more fair, because right now the number of people who are paying the sales tax, those people are, are, are families that struggle the most, 
who are paying the highest sales tax, mm -hmm. and those people who um, are high-end earners are not really paying their share. So we do need to restructure the tax system, and maybe this will force us to do some of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Are you then somewhat skeptical of whether this bill will be, or initiative, sorry, will be fully funded um, if it were to pass? Well, you have to have 60% of the legislature who would repeal it or mm -hmm. change it. And so that's a very high number of legislators, 60% right. so of the Senate, 60% of the House, um, in order to change it. After two years, you only need 50%. So at least for two years, you know, it would, it would pretty be assured that it would have to be paid, funded. I think what's important to recognize is the courts probably didn't exactly outline and define basic ed, and they mm. might accept this as part of basic ed. Okay. It's a possibility. So they're, you're saying they might consider this to be mm -hmm. one of the, the things that the legislature must do to right. vote? Okay. Okay. My next topic then is about higher education. Um, as, as you've been on the Higher Education Committee in the Senate, um, we've seen over the last decade this report from um, get.wa.gov said that um, it's been an annual increase of 9.7% um, for tuition rates in the state for the public research universities. 9.7% annually. That's, that's quite disturbing. Mm -hmm. What's disturbing as well, Dick, is that um, you take about 15 years ago, maybe 20, I would bet back in the 90s, um, the state was paying 70% of tuition and mm -hmm. the student was paying 30%. Today, the state is paying 30% and the student is paying mm -hmm. 70%. So we have underfunded um, higher ed for quite a few years now. Um, if you um, have to fully fund basic ed, mm -hmm. then if you're going to cut, it's easier to cut higher ed or to cut early learning because they aren't part of that paramount duty. So in the bill that I had that would do high-end earners paying the income tax, it actually lowered tuition, it um, actually funded early learning and then fully funded basic ed. So it was kind of a three-tiered bill. If um, you know, I think you remember there was an initiative to have um, income tax on high-end mm -hmm. earners and it was defeated. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try again. Okay. Yeah, and you saw recently in the news um, some interesting things. Every year, the state and the university president sort of play this game where they asked him for the universities mm -hmm. to make cuts. And recently, the president of Western Washington University said no. Um, and in fact, he actually um, asked for a 5% increase. Um, Bruce Shepard, yep. the president of Western Washington, said, he told the Seattle Times um, the, you know, the cycle of making cuts were, quote, idiotic. And he told the Seattle Times, if we go through with this, you'll see students start fleeing, faculty taking other jobs. My obligation is to protect the quality of the university. So no, I'm not going along. Um, that's uh, President Shepard. So how do you react to his comments? And as, as the legislature, what do you think about this issue? And, and what's the solution? Well, I think we all have to be part of the solution. Mm -hmm. And so if I um, was to actually have the higher ed committee um, meet with all the presidents and talk to the universities, it might be um, helpful if they could help us with their families and students mm -hmm. to kind of start a grassroots movement that says we have to pay for higher ed, we can't continue to cut, and this is how we're going to do it. And if we do it together, it will be a solution. If we simply say no um, and, and don't look for that solution, then that's not going to be helpful. Mm -hmm. Do you think, you know, we hear a lot from politicians and from um, corporate leaders that say, you know, college education is so important in this age especially, um, but yet college costs continue to rise and this is one of the largest, um, I, I think uh, you just saw student debt was just named as mm -hmm. the second largest group of debt just under uh, home mortgages. Mm -hmm. What do you think about the, the student de debt, debt sort of epidemic in our state? Is that... And are you concerned about that? Yes, very. In fact, on the higher ed committee, we hear students all the time talking about how much they actually um, owe in mm -hmm. debt. It is astounding, just astounding. So um, I believe, and I'm trying to recall, I haven't thought about it for a while, but I, I recall that some states are trying to actually pay for higher ed mm -hmm. and that they are moving towards some kind of revenue source that, that would be able to enable them to actually pay tuition. Um, it's an interesting concept. It's one that the people might support, um, and we need to look at that more closely. I believe that um, 
you know, other countries are challenging us. They're bringing in their, you know, students who have graduated from their universities. So if you take New Zealand or you take um, Africa, they don't pay their tuition. The, this country pays it for them. And mm -hmm. that's why they can take their best and brightest and go on to college and come here and um, be ready for our jobs because they don't have to pay for it. So our kids who are the best and brightest who can't afford it, they can't go. And that's not fair. Right. Well, anything else you'd like to add about education or the, the current fight over education funding in our state? Well, I said that the solution has to be with the people. Mm -hmm. And so I do believe strongly that families and students ought to rise up and say, we want, we'll support the legislature in their attempt to fund basic ed and to do early learning and help with college tuition. We'll, we'll, we'll accept whatever it is. Maybe it's going to be a high-end tax, maybe, but they got to help us. Mm -hmm. It's got to be a grassroots movement because we can't do it from the legislature without them. Okay. State Senator Rosemary McCall, thank you so much for joining us. Thank I you, Nick. I appreciate it. You were awesome. Thank you. <laughs>